All right, so we are going to examine the depiction of colonialism in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darwin. I suppose this is not the first time you have encountered Heart of Darkness. But well, for the purpose of depicting, or examining the depiction of colonialism in a modernist novel, it's important for us to examine or interrogate or reread Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, published in 1899. This is the last year of the 19th century when this novel was published. So it, in many ways, has the character of a modernist text. The subject matter of the novel is colonialism. Indeed, Conrad was one of the first English or European writers to depict colonialism in their works and to bring to the attention of the world, the atrocities perpetrated by European power in the colony. Until the publication of Heart of Darkness, little or nothing was known about the realities of the colonial project. In Africa, The novel is written from the first person narrative viewpoint. The story is narrated using the first person narrator. Actually, a better term for Heart of Darkness is a novella. It's a novella. Because of its length. The chief narrator of the novel is Charlie Malu.
The chief narrator of the novel is Charlie Malo. You will know that Malo is narrating when the narrator uses the first person singular pronoun I. There is another narrator though. Perhaps a companion on Malo's ship. Who supplements the narrative? And we know that he narrates using the the first person plural pronoun we. The temporality of the story. The temporality of the story is such that it takes place in the present. The temporality of the story is, is such that it takes place in the present. It begins in the present. And then Through the narration of Charlie Malo, Texas to the past. The special setting of the story. We said that it begins in England. The special setting of the story is such that it begins in England. Specifically on the River Thames. Specifically on the River Thames. where Malo and his companions are on a ship called Nelly. Where Malo and his companions are on a ship called the Nelly. The ship is resting on its anchor. The crew too are resting. And in the course of this rest, Malo, who is, who is known to be a good storyteller, begins to tell the story. Begins to tell the story of one of his adventures. Because you see, Malo has traveled the world. Just like any typical English person would. At this time, we must recall the average English person's love for adventure.
But this time around, he's telling the story of how he traveled to the Congo Free State. Voyage to the Congo, Congo Free State, and what he observed that as Malo tells us. After his last voyage, he soon became restless and wanted to go back to the sea or travel again. And so he begins to look for a ship. without success. He had to approach his aunt. He had to approach his aunt. A lady who had correct connections. It is the aunt who recommends Malo to highly placed persons. It's the aunt who recommends Malo to highly placed persons. <laughs> who are connected to the company. And they throw out the, the story, the particular name of the company is not mentioned, but it's a trading company. It's just called the company. But that is to suggest one, that is to suggest one, the economic interest of colonialism. The fact that they were more interested in there, exploiting Africa economically. Compared to what they told the world, that uh, they wanted to civilize Africa. Second, it also suggests to us that colonialism was run mostly through these trading companies who represented or which represented the political and economic interests of the country of origin represented the economic and political interests of the countries of origin. So through these recommendations, Malo is finally able to get an employment 
as a captain of a steamboat. As a captain of a steamboat. In fact, he is to travel to the Congo to take over from a former captain by name Fresh Levin. Former captain by name Fresh Levin. Who was killed by the son of the local chief for assaulting the father over a misunderstanding about the price of a hen. Press Levin was killed by the son of a local chief for assaulting the father over a misunderstanding about the price of a hand. As we are told, perhaps Press Levin felt that he had been cheated in the cell. And so he went ashore and started hitting the man until the, the sun intervened. And through a simple thrust of the spear, Press Levin is killed. We are also told that the, the whole village fled because a white man has been killed. The whole village fled because a white man has been killed. And of course, until Malo arrived there, there was no soul to be found. The settlement had, was abandoned, including Fresh Levin's, Fresh Levin's cups. Which now has grass growing through it. So, as we said, Malu is to replace Fresh Levin. as the captain of a steamboat. But before he leaves, he has to visit the company headquarters and sign some papers. These papers are in the form of an agreement between Malo and the company. And the most important aspects of this agreement are those that concern trade, trading. For instance, Malo is asked to sign that he will not reveal company trade secrets.
again, that suggests that the major interest of colonialism was economic and not necessarily about civilizing the natives. They were interested in their trade. Malo will not reveal any company secrets regarding trade. After this, Malo had to go for his medicals. After this, Malo has to go for his medicals. The doctor has to test whether Malo is fit for Africa. Whether Malo has what it takes medically to survive. In the heart of darkness, because you see the title of the novel, the title of the, no the novella is a metaphor for Africa. The title of the novella is a metaphor for Africa. Heart of darkness. Africa is the heart of darkness. And Malo is traveling into the heart of darkness. Like traveling from light into darkness. From Europe into Africa. So during the medical, during the medical, the doctor asks Malo some humorous questions. For instance, if there has ever been a case of madness in his family. <laughs> Because perhaps he feels that nobody in his right senses will go to Africa. <laughs> the doctor also tests Malo's heart, heartbeats, listens to the heartbeats, and says that the heart is good for Africa. So Malo travels to the Congo Free State. And it must be noted that this journey this journey is described through analogy and through contrast. Contrast through analogy is one of the major narrative devices in art dance. Contrast achieved through analogy is one of the major narrative devices in heart of darkness. So the contrast is seen in the depiction of European spaces compared to the depiction of African spaces. That's what the contrast is seen. Okay. European spaces are depicted as light, civilized. And African spaces are depicted as some um, dark, savage, uncivilized.
So in this story, Milo is moving from civilization to out of darkness, from a place that is civilized to a place that is primitive. And he and the company are supposed to be the thought bearers of European civilization. Milo and the company are supposed to be the touch bearers of European civilization. It's supposed to take European civilization to the heart of darkness. begins to tell us of the ongoing wars the destruction of the landscape the enslavement of the people the prevalence of hunger disease and death In Africa, all of this which signal the destabilization of the peace, the tranquility of Africa by the colonial, by competing colonial powers and by competing colonial interests. The colonial powers have turned the continent upside down. Because of their scramble for resources, they will not spare anyone, they will not spare the people, They are brutal and ruthless in their methods. And that is the and that is why the land is depicted as being under siege. So Africa, in the colonial period, was a restive space. It was a restive, restive space. Resting space. Dominated by wars and bloodshed, hunger, and diseases, enslavement of the people. First station. At the first station, Malo meets the company accountant.
He is perhaps the first white person that Malo meets in the jungle of Africa. What is interesting about this accountant is that he has managed to keep himself pristine. Managed to keep himself pristine, clean, untouched by the chaos of the African climate landscape. Which is why Malo calls him a miracle. A vision. Even though there are diseases around him, in fact, somebody is dying just by the accountant. Another white man, because you know the land fights back. The African landscape fought back against the colonial masters through diseases like malaria, through um, mosquito bites. From this station, Malo leaves for the central station with some 60 men. In fact, it is from the first station that Malo begins to hear about a very important character in the story by name Mr. Kurt. Mr. Kurt. But until this point, Malo's objective is to replace Fresh Levin. So Malo leaves for the central station. The journey will take some fifteen days. So when Malo gets to the central station, Malo's journey to the central station is eventful on two counts. One, Malo's journey to the central station is eventful on two counts. One, The men, uh, the white man he's traveling with, keeps fainting because of the climate. Because of the heat, because of the hot climate. And secondly, the men mutiny some of the men mutiny against Malo. By, dis by disappearing with loads and valuables. So Ma Malo is able to get to the central station on the 15th. So the fact that these 60 men are black men. It's indicative of the fact that blacks were used as workers by white people during colonialism. Most of 
them were forced to work for white people. There were instances where, because there were no cars, these blacks were used as some um, human vehicles. They were used as human vehicles. Mean that Malo probably did not walk all that mile. He was carried by one of the black men. Which is a true even because it actually happened. A white man would not walk any man will be carried by a strong black person. And no matter how long the man wants to go, let God not be with you and you fall with the white man. <laughs> right? So when Malo gets to the central station, he meets the station manager. He meets the station station manager. We are told that we are told that he has been a trader right from his youth and he has been in Africa for many years. That means experience there. Another interesting thing about this manager is that he does not fall ill. Even if everyone falls ill, all the white men will fall ill, still be strong. That means he has somehow um, adapted to the environment over time and probably has immunity just like the African. It is at the central station that Malo realizes that he will not be able to reach Kurt long enough, he will not be able to replace Press 11 just yet. The reason is that this, the reason is that the steamboat that he would have used was sunk and abandoned in the sea. Was sunk and abandoned in the sea. Was sunk, damaged and abandoned. Was sunk, damaged and abandoned in the sea. Given the events later in the novel, the revelations later in the novel, the novella, we will certainly say that this was a deliberate act. Okay? We could say that this was a deliberate act by the station manager and some of the powerful people in the company to punish Mr. Cutts. Because it is this steamboat, you know, Mr. Cutts stays and manages the inner station of the company. And it is this boat that is used to access that place because it's far away. 
to give supplies like food, medicine, and all of that. And so if the boat is sunk and damaged, and nobody cares about repairing it, then it will take a long time before anything medicine could reach Mr. Kurt, supposing he's ill. Okay? So this is a case of systematic abandonment of Mr. Kurt, but we'll learn that later in the novel. In the novel. Because you see, um, the, 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 the politics of colonialism is cruel, even among the white people. Politics of colonialism is cruel, even among white people themselves. So, Malo realizes that the boat has sunk, and it will take him three months to repair the boat. He has to retrieve the boat, and he has to repair it in the course of three months. So he will be stuck at the central station for this length of time. He'll be stuck at the central station for this length of time. While here at the central station, Malo learns firsthand the politics of the trading, trading company, which is nothing but the economic politics of colonialism. The station manager tells Malo about Kurtz and Mr. Kurtz. We have more information about Mr. Kurtz. How he is valuable to the company. You know, the, 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 the device that Conrad uses in this novel is to, you know, present Mr. Kurtz to us. It's to present Mr. Kurtz to us as a towering figure, it's a towering figure. A larger than life character. Someone with heroic attributes. And then, to disappoint us when we finally meet Mr. Curtis. And then to disappoint us when we finally meet Mr. Curtis. Which is why we can safely say that Mr. Curtis' character is anti heroic Mr. Curtis' character is what? anti In the modernist novel, we don't have heroes we have anti heroes And who, are, who is, a, who, who is a, a, an anti-hero? An anti-hero is a hero, but without heroic traits. He's a hero, but without the admirable traits expected or required of a hero. That's an anti-hero. Anti-hero is the hero that does not have the conventional attributes of a hero. As anti-hero, supposed to be brave, kind, supposed to be um, one who has um, serves sacrificial qualities. But the anti-hero lacks all of this. So that's what we mean by that. So the, the hero of the modernist novel is anti-hero. The major character of the modernist novel has anti-hero qualities. And that's what we mean in Mr. Kurt. So Marlon learns that 
Mr. Kurtz now learns at the central station from the central station manager that Mr. Kurtz is one of the most valuable agents that the company has ever had. Okay? Company has ever had. And of course, if a company says that you're valuable, that means you bring in money. But it, no, no, no other thing will make you valuable to the company, right? To a company, to a trading company, you have to be able to bring in the money. And we are told that Malo brings in more ivory, more ivory. Ivory is one of the most important commodities in the colonial trade, in the Congo, all right? And of course, you know that they get it from the elephant. And when you consider the huge number of ivory brought in, we also consider the number of elephants that have been sacrificed. So we are told that Malo brings in more ivory compared to all the other agents put together, compared to what the other agents put together bring. Malo brings in more. So that's how he's valuable. Company. Oh, sorry, Mr. Kurtz. Mr. Kurtz, no, no, really Mr. Kurtz bring in. Mr. Kurtz brings in more ivory than all the other agents of the company put together. And this is why Mr. Kurtz is considered valuable to the company. But then, the company manager describes Mr. Kurtz in the past tense. Meaning that he's not considered so valuable anymore. Maybe there's something that Mr. Kurtz had done that displeased the manager. And we will soon get to know that it is because of his methods of ivory collection. You get to know that it is because of uh, Mr. Kurtz's method of ivory collection. Because to bring in so much ivory, perhaps conventional methods would not do. So perhaps Mr. Kurtz has used unorthodox, unconventional methods of ivory collection. And that must have displeased the manager. At about this time, the company manager's uncle arrives from Europe. And Malo overhears, Malo overhears a sinister conversation between the company manager and the uncle about Mr. Kurtz. It is from this conversation 
that we get to know the plot against Mr. Kurtz. We get to know the, the plot against Mr. Kurtz. The manager and the uncle had made up plans, had made plans to destroy Mr. Katz. We also learn from here at the central station that Mr. Katz is ill. We also learn at this point that Mr. Katz is ill. But that there has been no genuine information about him. After all, no boat has gone in there for many months. So Mr. Kurtz's illness is more or less like a rumor at this point. We are also introduced to a first class agent who has been at the central station for over a year without being productive in any way, without being productive in any way. His primary duty is to make bricks. His primary duty is to make bricks. But for over a year, he has, not, he has not been able to make even one brick. And the reason is that he has no straw. He has no straw to make brick. In my interpretation, I see this as one of the one of the instances of the wastefulness of the colonial project. It's, an, it, it's inability to manage men and resources. Okay? One of the instances of the wastefulness of the colonial project, especially its inability to manage men and resources. This reminds us of Malu. Because Malu has to wait for about a month in order to not get the, the, the material that he needs to make the books.
But now that he's looking for them, they are nowhere to be found. together. This is what Malu needs to repair the boats, but they can't be found where he is. He has to wait for some time before they arrive. We are also told of the rapid promotion of Mr. Kurtz in the company. Also told of the rapid promotion of Mr. Kurtz in the company and, and they and his future promise, the fact that he might soon be manager because of his efficiency, his importance, his value in the company. So what is interesting about this story is how we are suddenly being brought face to face with a character that we were not thinking would become so important. We thought this story was going to be about maybe Press 11, maybe about Mala himself. But as we, we see, we get, we get to see that someone we did not expect to be a major character, somebody that we hardly see becoming a major character, and that's Mr. Kurt. It's part of the ingenuity of Conrad in telling his story. In fact, Kurt becomes a major character in the novel, not because we meet him often, but because we talk about him ever so often. Right? So at the, at the central station, we are also told of a fire incident. That raises a hut full of um, valuable products, or perhaps valuable products of the colonial trade. But because of the nature of the hut, the hut is made of grass, the fire just burns everything in a second. Even though some men try to, some men try to, quench the fire by running to the river with buckets and pouring the water on the path. The speed does not match the speed of the fire consuming the hot and yet the water is inside. At the central station too, the first class agent who could not make break tells 
Malo more about Mr. Kurtz. And once Malo to represent him well before Mr. Kurtz. Because this first class agent thinks that Mr. Kurtz will be someone important in the company very soon. So he's very careful of how he speaks about Mr. Kurtz, even though he cannot hide his jealousy. Because probably he wanted the position where Mr. Kurtz is occupying at the moment. He says, for instance, that just a year ago, Kurtz had been at the central station, had arrived at the central station, right? And now he has taken over the position that he would have wanted to take. He's the assistant manager. Okay? So he feels frightened by Mr. Kurtz. He's jealous of Mr. Kurtz, doesn't like him, but cannot help speaking well of him so that Malo will tell Mr. Kurtz that this is what the first class agent said about him. Finally, when the boat has been repaid, the journey to the, to the inner station begins. Remember, the inner station is where Mr. Kurt rules and reigns. This journey too is eventful. It is during this journey that Conrad really describes the natives in racist terms. The natives in racist terms. In racist terms. It is during this journey that Malad really describes the natives in racist terms. Sees them as savages. Primitive depicts them naked or half naked. Depicts the native in parts, not as a whole. Depicts them in parts, not as a whole. Depicts the natives in parts, not as a whole. And by depicting them, depicting them in part, he denied them their humanity. Because what Malo says are the eyes, the hands, and not whole human beings, the teeth. And not whole human beings. And by, I said, by depicting them in part, denied them their humanity. Not human beings. He, he also denies them language because language humanizes. So denies them language. He represents their speech as unintelligible. Malo represents, um, Conrad represents through Malo the speech of the natives as what? Unintelligible as unintelligible. As if it is not language of the language of real human beings, the speech, the speeches come in screams, in whimpers, in uh, comes in the speeches come in pieces. Pass, wing pass, screams, howling, shouts, but nothing really, really um, intelligible.
He also depicts them as cannibals in their wanting to eat fellow um, blacks of enemy tribes. Picks Africans as cannibals. And you must understand that this was the general colonialist perception of Africa. If we must talk about colonialism and its depiction on, in literature concerning Africa, we need to start with the white people who wrote about Africa first, like Malu, uh, like Conrad. And then we have to see how Africans were depicted in these works. As I've said, they are depicted not as human beings, but as savages, as primitive. They are depicted as slaves, as workers. They are depicted as unintelligent, unsophisticated. They are depicted as cannibals. They are depicted as people lacking the ability to speak language. They are unable to speak intelligibly. They simply use um, short, short words and expression. Okay, like catch him, eat. I eat, catch him. So the words are not intelligible. No sophistication in speech. So as the, as the party, as the crew, as the voyage nears uh, Mr. Kurt's uh, dwelling, there is an attack by hostile natives. An attack by hostile natives. They, are, they mostly attack with arrows. We attack with arrows, whereas Malo and the white men have the rifles. Have the rifles. Of course, in the novel, it's the rifles are represented through a metonym known as Winchester. Yeah, they are Winchesters. That's a metonym for rifles. Probably that was popular at the time. So in the attack, one of the blacks who steered the, the, the boat was, uh, is killed. One of the blacks who stays the boat is killed. We call him the helmsman. Killed. This man is killed. And Malo soon throws the body overboard. We will later understand that this attack was ordered by Mr. Kurtz because Mr. Kurtz sometimes will not feel like leaving the station. He knows that they have come to take him back. They will only take him back because he's ill. So he orders the native to attack. In the course of the, uh, in the, course of the voyage, in the course of the voyage, and of course, sometimes the native do not want my, um, Mr. Kurtz to leave, to leave them. In the course of the voyage too, we, we are taken to,
a dwelling place, formerly occupied by a white man who had now who had now abandoned the place. One of the one of the valuable items that Malo picks from this place is a book, a manuscript. And we will soon learn that this place was occupied by a Russian. A Russian. A Russian explorer who is now Kurt's companion. An easy companion anyway. It's now Kurt's companion. When we get to Kurt's inner station, we will learn more about Kurtz through this Russian. Because Mr. Kurtz will not be able to speak for himself because he is ill. All right? In fact, the first time we will see Mr. Kurtz when we get to the inner station is him being brought on a stretcher to the boat. And being brought on a stretcher to the boat. So, from the Russian, we learn that Mr. Kurtz had fraternized with the natives. Mr. Kurtz had fraternized with the natives, mixed up with them, made himself their leader. made himself to be worshipped by the natives. Made himself a cult figure before the natives. Participate in their rites. We also told that Mr. Kurt had the penchant to explore the land and discover more villages. He will go on, he will go out to explore the land and to discover more villages. Especially, for instance, we are told that he discovers the leg tribe. So we are told of the leg tribe that Mr. Kurtz has discovered. The leg try. Whose men he is now leading as uh, warriors to raid enemy tribes and take more ivory. We are also told of the report that Mr. P uh, Mr. Kurt was asked to write. By the Society for the Suppression of uh, Savage People. And he reports, he wrote the report in 17 pages. In that report, Mr. Kurtz in that report, Mr. Kurtz
Stats dads. That white people are superior to black people. And that this superiority should be maintained. That black people should be made constantly to see white people as gods, as their gods. this report by recommending the extermination of black people, the annihilation of black people, in the expression exterminate the brutes. After all, his brutes means animal. So he sees black people as not being human enough. It says exterminate the brutes. That's how Mr. Kurt Haynes' 17 page report. So the, the views expressed by Mr. Kurt in his report tally with the colonialist view of Africans. Africans were viewed as inferior to white people, less than human. We needed to be either civilized or destroyed. We are also introduced to the cruelty of Mr. Kurtz, his high handedness, his high handedness in the collection of ivory, his high handedness in the collection of ivory. This exemplified in the scores, in the scores of black people attached to poles in the inner station. Apparently, must have killed these black people as a form of punishment and deterrent to others, and then hook that skull on the pole to warn others about disobeying him. In fact, the Russian tells a story of how Mr. Kurtz nearly killed him when he wanted to withhold one ivory from Mr. Kurtz. So it's shown that Mr. Kurtz is crazy when it comes to ivory and ivory collection. And he could do anything for it, can kill for it. Even if it has to be the life of another white man. That is his method of ivory collection. That's why it has been so successful. He spares nobody. Perhaps his only friend, the only thing he values in life is ivory, which is why, while on the ship, when Mr. Kurtz tells the company manager, save me, the company, the company manager says, you mean save the ivory? <laughs> So by the time we get to see Mr. Kurtz, we see him as a sick and helpless figure about to die, which is disappointing, which is anticlimactic, all right? 
which is quite disappointing because this is not the man, the image that has been painted. We are, we, are, we are told of a man who is um, larger than life, only for us to meet him in the street, sick and helpless, and about to die. He has been consumed by his own actions, he has been consumed by his own darkness. Because you see, Mr. Kurtz is not only ill physically, Mr. Kurtz is ill psychologically. It might be that the atrocities of his actions have consumed him physically and mentally. So Mr. Kurtz is loaded to the uh, boat. We're also told that Mr. Kurt has a mistress in Africa, a black woman. He's married a black woman. Notwithstanding the fact that Mr. Mr. Kurt had a fiance back in Europe. Okay, so when we finally get to meet Mr. Kurt, there's nothing really left for us to admire about him. Whether it is his love life, whether it is his personality, his appearance, or his action, there's nothing left for us to admire. Which is why Mr. Kurt is an anti hero. He has a mistress back home who adores him, has good memories of him, but he has a mistress in Africa as well. So, we are also told that Mr. Kurt has gathered um, the largest number of ivory ever. Remember, there was no boots for a long time. And so this ivory is loaded to the ship and there's really not enough space for it. Some are loaded outside on the deck of the ship. Okay. So the journey back to the central station resumes. Of course, the station manager had come to see things for himself. They know that Kurt is about to die. Remember, they abandoned him. They knew he was ill. They refused to send him medicine. Destroyed the boots so that the boots would not get to him. The Russian said that, the Russian was um, explicit in saying that Mr. Kurt was abandoned by the company, that he served so well over the past one year. And who made that abandonment possible? The manager, his uncle, because they disliked Kurt's methods of ivory collection. They destroyed the boat, so no boat would go to Mr. Kurt, no medicine to go to him. And so by the time they got there, he cannot be saved. Even though Kurt says, I'll be back, I'll return, it's just a wishful statement because he's ill beyond life. But perhaps Mr. Kurt would have survived, except that on the way back, the steamer breaks down again. And as I read the novel, I think it's, just, it's also another act of sabotage. The steamer breaks down again and has to be repaid for many days. Okay? And I think the, uh, the breakdown of the steamer at this point is what breaks Mr. Kurt's will to leave. Because Mr. Kurt is determined to get well again, return to the inner station to continue with his mission. But then the steamer breaks down on the return journey. And that probably also breaks Mr. Kurt's will to leave. 
And so when Mr. Kurtz knows that he is going to die, of course, I'm, I'm sure the manager, the manager will, will ensure that the steamer will remain broken down until Mr. Kurtz dies. So when Mr. Kurtz realizes he's going to die, he hands over his papers to Mr. Malo, to Charlie Malo, the papers I have document the reports, uh, letters from his wife, um, and every document that he has in his position, hands them over to man. And not long after this, Mr. Kurtz dies. His death is described in psychological terms. He is seen to be in psychological darkness. And his last words are, oh, the horror, the horror. This is mental, right? Maybe his dark deeds are coming back to haunt him at the moment of death. OK? But when? Malo meets the mistress in Europe, Kurt's mistress in Europe. He will lie that Kurt's final words was her name. <laughs> Just to make the woman keep believing in the ideal Kurt. Kurt has the ideal lover, patient, heroic, loving, pure, clean, admirable. Because you see, one year after Mr. Kurt's death, the woman is still mourning him. But the woman knows the truth of Kurt's action in Africa, plus the fact that he had a mistress, a black mistress for that matter, maybe she will even mourn him for one day. <laughs> but here is the lady mourning court for over a year. And as she tells Malo, it's as if Mr. Kurt had died yesterday. All right? So you could see the disparity between who the individual is and how the individual is perceived. So Kurt dies and is buried in the muddy waters. Far away from home. In fact, the, the narrator says that something, he saw something buried in a muddy pool. Something. Just buried by the seaside. That's no more, that's no more court. And then the company now fights over the paper that is left behind. With Malo. Malo refuses to give up everything. Of course, what the company wants are papers that reveal um, locations that have economic assets. They want to know the land that Kurtz discovered that had ivory. That's why they're interested in Kurtz's papers and documents. Okay? Malo will give the Kurtz uh, reports to a journalist, and then will hand over the personal letters to the mistress. Apparently, they couldn't marry because the woman's family did not approve of the marriage. And we are also told that Mr. Kurt was a musician by his cousin who met Malu. So this is in a way the story of the heart of darkness 
as narrated by Malu to us. When we meet again, we will interrogate the facts about the colonialist depiction in the novel. Good morning. Mm -hmm.